Hi, Hello. hi, we're Jo and Duncan and we're part of the God First hosting team for this coming Sunday and we would love to invite you to join us. It's on Sunday at half past ten, just click on the link. We're really looking forward to it, we've got a new platform that we're using, it's called Church Online. Uh, there's some worship, there's uh, some preaching, we're believing for encounter with yes. God. We're meeting differently but we're still family, uh, we're seeing people healed. Even last week we heard of someone being saved just as one of our members went round uh, and met with them and just led that lady to the Lord. So one Wonderful so story. Good. So gathering this Sunday, uh, opportunity to gather before and kind of type messages to each other, get prayed for, uh, have kind of chats with hosting team, etc., etc. So I think something really exciting, although different, uh, is coming our way. So then, family, we'd love to connect with you. Join us on Sunday at half past ten. See you then. See you then.
Well, good morning. Welcome to our Easter Sunday God First service. It is so good to have you with us. It might be that you're at our half 10 service or at our 8 p.m. service, uh, but either of which you are so welcome in joining. Can I say it might be that you're gathering with us at God First for the first time ever and it's such a privilege that we can come to your lounge to bring you the best news ever and that news is this, that Jesus died for you, he's risen from the dead which is what we're celebrating today and he's seated in heaven and he's calling you home to be with him. If it if it's that you want to find out more about Jesus today, can I just ask you and suggest to you, why don't you just click the request prayer button and one of our team will chat to you, point you to the resources and information that you can find out more from our website. That would be a really great thing to do. Kids, uh, I know that you'll be joining in now and can imagine uh, different families gathered round uh, in their lounges. You've got worksheets to do and colouring sheets to do. This is a great moment to gather uh, as family. Teenagers, I know you'll be in the room uh, enjoying stuff as well, so you are so welcome. It doesn't really matter how old you are, how young you are. We just want to say it's good to be together to celebrate the most amazing news ever, that Jesus is is alive. It's such good news and I'm so excited. We've got Chris Kilby uh, preaching later. He's just really good at explaining the Christian faith. So again, if you're not aware of who Jesus is really or what he did or what this Resurrection Sunday, this Easter Sunday really means, he's going to explain it. But for those of us who have been Christians years, that's exciting for us too to remember and celebrate Jesus is alive. Uh, and so wherever you are in the world, whatever age you are, this is the most relevant news uh, you will ever hear. Uh, in just a moment, uh, Sam is going to, uh, with some of the kids in the church, is going to do a Bible reading. So that's going to be quite cool. Uh, and then after that, we've got a spoken word. Uh, and so just to encourage us and focus our attention on Jesus. Uh, so God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being part of this online with us. Uh, and may you know God's blessing and his resurrection power on this Resurrection Sunday. To start our service, we'll be reading Matthew 28 verses 1 to 10. The day after the Sabbath day was the first day of the week. At dawn on the first day, Mary Magdalene and another woman named Mary went to look at the tomb. At that time, there was a strong earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven. The angel went to the tomb and rolled the stone away from the entrance. Then he sat on the stone. He was shining as bright as lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. The soldiers guarding the tomb were very fr frightened of the angel. They shook with fear and then became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, the one who was killed on the cross, but he is not here. He has risen from death as he said he would. Come and see the place where his body was. And go quickly and tell his followers, say to them, Jesus has risen from death. He is going into Galilee. He will be there before you. You will see him there. Then the angel said, now I've told you. The woman left the tomb quickly. They were afraid, but they were also very happy. They ran to tell Jesus' followers what had happened. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. The woman came up to Jesus, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go on to Galilee. They will see me there. First day, Friday, charged with blasphemy, battered, bruised and beaten bloody, forced to injure torture reserved for the worst of criminals, the minimal his accusers would settle for was his death. Strung between two others, the Son of God displayed, the sin of the world weighed upon his shoulders, flayed by soldiers' cruel lashes. An oppressive gloom cloaked the world, the wrath of God unfurled upon him, sin had placed its curse upon him. The temple curtain tore in two, earth shook, rock split as graves were moved. The sun became slave to death, and all creation held its breath. Second day, Saturday, Sabbath rest. The disciples' faith put to the test, hopelessness abounding, bound in grieving, lies deceiving, fear surrounding. The earth's lungs are burning, desperately fighting just to keep on turning, yearning for its king as the sound of weeping becomes its anthem song. 
third day, sun arises with the dawn. A new creation has been born with Christ's first breath. Earth breathes once more as he kicked down death's door. That one-way system is no more. Mary boldly gives her testimony. Angels showed her grave clothes only. The disciples wonder at the tomb now empty. We've been set apart, made holy, counted as God's family. You see, if Christ has not been raised, then this faith is all in vain. But the price has been paid and nothing remains in that grave. The great exchange took place. Our sin for his right standing, his sonship for our shame. His the only name that saves. Sin no longer waves us, we stand on the rock of ages. He's courageous, his love never fails us, always engages. He's tremendous, momentous, excessive, outrageous. He never changes, his name is Jesus.
history, Lord, we just say we welcome you. We love your presence, Jesus, and we say thank you for all you've done. So let's celebrate this. Thank you, Lord.
and we celebrate you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us. Amen. Wow, wasn't that an amazing worship time? Thank you, Joe, for leading us and the amazing band uh, behind you. Uh, so talented. Um, just to say uh, that it might be that you're not a Christian and you've just been part of that worship time and perhaps sung the words or read the words on the screen. Can I say that those words are just full of truth, that Jesus is alive uh, and he wants to bring you home to him. So I would encourage you again, if you want to find out more, just click that request prayer button uh, and someone will chat to you and point you in the right direction and help you on your journey of faith. Really the best thing you will ever explore is all about Jesus and what he did and what Easter really means, that he is alive uh, and he loves you dearly. Right now we're going to uh, take our offering. Now again this is a bit weird because we're on camera and so on but as part of a church family, the, those of us who would call, call God, for, God First our, our home church, uh, part of our worship is to give to God uh, and uh, one of the ways we do that normally is we pass a bucket round and people put into that. There's never any pressure with finance ever uh, but it might be that uh, the fact that we can't gather, uh, you're thinking how do I give? Well you can give by just clicking that button on the screen, it will take you through to to a secure uh, online portal that you can give financially and we would obviously encourage you to do that. It might be you're looking in from all over the place. If you want to bless the ministry of all that we're seeking to do at God First with lifting up the name of Jesus, feel free to give. If you're a guest just looking in, no pressure. Uh, we just want you to chill. The real thing we want you to hear is the news about Jesus. Also on other news, just want to say that if you want to connect more uh, into the community of the church, you can click on our website and uh, even join one of our coffee chat groups, which are groups that meet after a Sunday service or there's groups that meet midweek as well. You can do that online. We're doing that over the platform called Zoom. So that's kind of a virtual platform that works really well, actually. Or just fill out one of our contact cards and we'll be in contact. Or it might be that you think in the week, I want prayer. Just click our, uh, our request prayer button on this online site and you can uh, someone will be in contact and we'll pray for you and if you want even call you up and talk to you and pray for you uh, so we're going to hand over right now to Chris Kilby uh, Chris is a dear friend actually I've known him for many many years uh, he's really good as I said earlier explaining about Jesus uh, and he's now going to come and talk from the Bible and share the truth really around all that Jesus is and what he's done. And then after that, I'm going to give us opportunity to respond to what he's said. So, Chris, over to you. Well, good morning, God First Church. It's great to be with you on this Easter Sunday. Uh, sorry I can't be with you in person, but then you're not together either. So, hey-ho. But it's fantastic to be with you. And uh, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to look at perhaps the most extraordinary event in human history. Uh, let me start with a question. Can a dead person come alive again? It's not general in our experience, is it? But really, humanity has at its very heart a highly unlikely event. But what I want to look at today is, did it really happen? Can we really trust the accounts? What are the facts? And I want us to come to it today with a slightly more analytical approach. Because for those of you that believe, I want you to be convinced of the historicity of this one event, the resurrection of the man Jesus. For those of you that are maybe a little more sceptical, I want you to understand that this isn't mere fantasy. And I want you to consider the facts as presented. And for those of you that would say this is a physical impossibility, I just want to raise a few questions for you today and ask you to consider perhaps that something incredible may have occurred on that first Easter morning. You see, the resurrection is an important feature and it's important as a fact and it has huge implications for you and I. Let me just read one account of the resurrection of Jesus. It's from Matthew's Gospel, the account, one of the accounts of Jesus' life and death and ministry. And this is from Matthew 27, starting at verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said that after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So, I'm going to briefly unpack some of the evidence for this strange event. I want you to be certain of whether this is true or not, so that you can take advantage of this resurrection in your own life and the good that it achieved. I want you to understand today, not just that Jesus rose, but why he rose. And I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of my message, perhaps, to believe it for the first time so that you can get to know this risen Jesus. So let's begin with a couple of facts. There was a tomb and on that first Easter morning there were only two options for the tomb. Either it was occupied, there was a body in it, or it was empty, there was no body in it. There aren't really any other options open to us, either it was occupied or empty. So I'm going to start with a few of the theories that people have come up with to disprove the resurrection, but acknowledging that the tomb was occupied. So the first of those is sometimes called the unknown tomb theory. Uh, it goes a bit like this. The theory is that, that no one actually knew where the tomb was. So even though the body was in a tomb somewhere, nobody could find it. Uh, the probable, or probable origin of this theory was that for many years it was believed that those that were crucified uh, were, were taken down from the cross and were thrown into like a common pit. And so there wouldn't have been an identifiable tomb. But in 1968, a, a breakthrough discovery was made and the remains of a man called Johann Ben Halgalgal were found in a family tomb, in a group tomb outside Jerusalem. Now, the thing about this man, Johann Ben Halgalgal, was that he, he'd he been crucified himself. And so those that had purported to have this theory that, that all crucified people were just thrown into a common pit, that was at this point disproved because he was in a family too. And, and so we know that, that there were um, examples of that happening. But there are some other weaknesses to this unknown tomb theory. Uh, firstly, it, it clearly ignores the story of where Jesus was buried. We've just read it. He was buried in somebody's private tomb, a man called Joseph of Arimathea. He had his own private tomb that, he'd, that he owned, and, and we're told that that's where Jesus was taken. And we're also told that the women saw his body being prepared for a burial in the traditional Jewish way. So, so not only do we know where the tomb was, others saw him being prepared there. And also, the Roman guards clearly knew where the tomb was because they wanted to guard it. You can't guard a tomb if you don't know where the tomb is. So there are several holes in that theory. The second occupied tomb theory is, is similar, but this one's called the, the wrong tomb theory. 
So it's similar to the unknown to theory, but it claims this. It, it claims that when the women return the following day, they, in their, in their grief uh, and their fear, perhaps they absentmindedly went to the wrong tomb. So they thought they were going to the tomb where Jesus was laid, but they went to the wrong one. There, there, there's, there's some reason for this. Certainly many of these rock tombs were very similar in size and style and, and position. And this theory claims that when they arrived, they, they, they didn't go to the right one. They just went to the wrong one. And they went to one where a stone hadn't been rolled in front of the, the cave, but a stone had been was still rolled away. Uh, and in this uh, theory, uh, we're told that this young man uh, guesses what they've come for and says to them, he's not here. See where they laid him and points to another tomb, points to a, a different tomb. Um, but the women somehow being worried that they might get caught or found out, they, they run off before checking this, this second tomb. But there are again several holes in this theory of the wrong tomb. Firstly, it ignores all the evidence. None of the evidence points to them going to the wrong tomb. Secondly, it denies what the figure at the tomb actually says. He doesn't just say, he's not here, see where they laid him. What he actually said was, he is not here, for he has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. So he clearly describes the place as being the place where Jesus was lying. And people that claim this wrong tomb theory to be true simply leave out those important phrases that were spoken by the angel. Also, do you and I honestly believe that anyone would forget where they buried their loved one just 72 hours after the trauma of burying them? I find it highly unlikely. But if this tomb, wrong tomb theory is true, not only did the women go to the wrong tomb, but then when they found out, Peter and John, the disciples, they went to the wrong tomb too. And then the Jews went to the wrong tomb. Also, the Romans went to the wrong tomb. The guard would have gone to the wrong tomb. Even Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb it was, went to the wrong tomb. And even the angel who was there <laughs> was at the wrong tomb. It's an absurd theory and it doesn't fit any of the facts. The third of the occupied tomb theories is sometimes called the legend theory. Uh, and this is based on the idea that there's an element of story about it, legend about it, that, uh, that, that came out some years after Jesus' life. Um, and that, that it was those legends that developed the story of a resurrection. So no evidence of it at the time, but later on, perhaps some stories were shared that became Christian legend. But, but that doesn't fit the historicity of the New Testament accounts. What we have in the New Testament are eyewitness accounts talking about the resurrection written by eyewitnesses. And when Paul wrote about it just a few decades later, there were still almost 500 eyewitnesses that were still alive at the time. And all scholars have said that a legend theory could never be substantiated. It can't be a legend when you're dealing with eyewitness accounts. Another of the occupied tomb theories is sometimes called the spiritual resurrection theory. And again, this is a little different. The idea of this one is that Jesus, like all of us, was body and spirit and that his spirit was raised from the dead and his body just decayed in the same way that any other human body would decay. And that initially seems plausible. You think, well, OK, maybe he did rise from the dead spiritually. Is the body really that important? But actually, this theory was actually blown apart by Jesus himself. Because you see, as Jesus rose from the dead and as his disciples saw him risen, they actually thought it was just a spirit. They thought it was a spiritual resurrection. And Jesus told them off. He said, no, no, look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's me. Touch me. I've got flesh and I've got bones just like you. You know, a bit later on, Jesus invited them to come and eat some fish with his with with one another eat fish together and, and spirits generally don't eat fish i mean I, it would kind of fall out i don't know it, but, but anyway the facts don't don't fit 
the theory. He clearly had a mouth and a, a stomach and a digestive system. He was flesh. Also, Matthew tells us that when they met him, they, they took hold of his feet and worshipped him. I don't know. I've never tried to grab the feet of a spirit, but I would imagine it would be a bit like this rather than like this. They were holding on to something that was solid. You see, the facts, again, don't fit the theory. It disregards all the evidence. Plus the obvious thing that there was no decayed body. Uh, just a minor detail. If it had just been a spiritual resurrection and there was a body left, then there was a body to be found and to disprove any kind of physical resurrection. Another of these occupied tomb theories is, and perhaps the most popular one that's often referred to, is the hallucination theory. This would be about the most popular of the theories that try and explain away the resurrection. And, and the theory is this, that the people who witness Christ in his bodily form after his death, they saw something, or at least they thought they saw something. They genuinely believed they saw something, but they were actually hallucinating. And this theory would dismiss every appearance in one go. So we have to ask the question, is that possible? Were they hallucinating? Well, hallucination is a, it has its origins in a Latin word. It's an anglicised version of a Latin word, hallucination. Uh, and that literally means a wandering of the mind. Or sometimes it can refer to kind of idle talk and gossip. It only actually became a technical psychology word in medical terms in the 19th century. The modern definition of the word hallucination is this. The perception of an object or pattern of light which is not objectively present. Basically seeing something that isn't there. So what's wrong with the hallucination theory? Well, psychologically, hallucinations generally affect certain types of people. People who perhaps have some form of mental illness, most often paranoia or schizophrenia. And when we look in the New Testament accounts, Jesus is described as a, appearing to all sorts of different people. And at one time, over 500 people would have all had to have the same hallucination at the same time. Now, hallucinations are generally personal. They're linked to an individual's sub subconscious. They're linked to his or her past experiences. And it's highly, highly unlikely that two or more people would have the same hallucination at the same time. Yet the accounts tell us that he appeared to many and they all saw the same thing in some detail. Any psychologist would say that this was not a hallucination, but a human response to something that was real, something that was physical. They all saw him. They all saw him. And quite simply, a hallucination doesn't sit down and have dinner with you and invite you to poke them to see if they're real. And for this many people to hallucinate the same thing at the same time would take greater faith for me to believe in than the miracle of the resurrection itself. You see, the hallucination theory doesn't take the facts into account. It doesn't take into account the empty tomb or any of the other physical evidence. So those are some of the, the theories of there being an occupied tomb, the body actually being there. The other option is that the tomb genuinely was empty, the, and we'll call these the empty tomb theories. So let's move on to those for a moment. You see, it's clear from all the eyewitness accounts that the tomb was empty. This is a very well attested historical fact. The question is not whether the tomb was empty or not. The question was, how do people explain that without believing in a miracle? So let's look at some facts. So here's a fact. No one had the body. No one had it. If anyone might have had it, it would have been Christ's enemies who would have taken it. Or the Roman security who might have hidden it. They were the last ones to have the body before the resurrection. 
And if the tomb wasn't empty, anybody from Jerusalem could have popped down and disproved the resurrection. But the body wasn't there. And the Christians knew it and the Jews knew it. The historian, Dr. Paul Mayer, he said this. If all the evidence is weighed carefully and fairly, it is indeed justifiable, according to the canons of historical research, to conclude that the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, in which Jesus was buried, was actually empty on the first Easter. And no shred of evidence has yet been discovered in literary sources, epigraphy or archaeology that would disprove this statement. So what actually happened? Some say that the disciples stole the body. They stole it and then they made up this resurrection story to advance the cause of Jesus and to help the cause of his followers and the church. And actually this, th this theory was re recorded by Matthew, but he clearly thought it was so ridiculous that he didn't even bother to refute it. We get to read in Matthew how this theory came about because the, the chief priests and the, uh, the elders had bribed one of the guards a, a large sum of money to get him to start the rumour. And they said to him that he had to, to make up a story. He said, they said to him, we'll give you this money. You make up a story about the disciples coming in the night and nicking Jesus uh, while you were asleep. And there's a big problem with this theory. It's almost laughable. Um, so if the guard was asleep, which he claimed to be, how exactly did he know that it was the disciples who stole the body. I mean, it simply wouldn't hold up in any court of law. You can almost imagine this guard being cross-examined. Please tell me, where were you? Oh, I was outside the tomb, sir. And, and what exactly were you doing? Oh, I was, I was sleeping, sir. It's been a very, very busy day. And uh, what happened next exactly? Well, the, those guys, those followers of Jesus, they turned up and they, they nicked his body, sir. You're a clever man. You saw all of that? Well, yes, sir, I did. With your eyes closed while you were asleep? Oh. You see, just, just doesn't work. But <laughs> humour aside, in reality, a sleeping guard was highly improbable. We're talking here about crack Roman soldiers. Sleeping on duty was punishable by death. And if the disciples had turned up, the guards would have just mashed them. Remember these guys, they were the guys that ran away when the, guard, when the guards turned up to arrest Jesus in the garden just a few nights earlier. Also, just thinking about it, the Roman guard must have been deaf if he was awake. We've got this huge stone up to one and a half tons being moved away. That would have taken some doing. I remember some years ago, a friend of mine and I, I was when we moved into our house and I bought a, a roll top bath on eBay, a cast iron roll top bath. And when I went to pick it up, it had been installed in a basement. And uh, so me and my friend had to hoik with ropes and shoulders this cast iron bath up a set of stairs. I mean, that was jolly hard work. And we, we huffed and we puffed. And I think to move a one and a half to two ton rock, would have required a similar amount of huffing and puffing. But apparently it all happened without any fuss, according to the stolen by the disciples theory. But there's another challenge with this theory. There's another flaw, really, and it's about character. It's about the character of the disciples. See, everywhere we read about these disciples, history describes them as honourable men. In fact, Many historians put the rapid rise of early Christianity down to the character and the good morality of the Jesus followers, the first Christians. And to believe that they would have not only stolen the body, but then have to maintain a lie amongst them all for years that went against what their master taught about truth and lies and have to maintain that for the rest of their lives, proclaiming a lie, 
and even going to their death for something that they know is a lie is highly improbable. You just don't die for something that you know is a lie. In the last moment, you say, no, 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 no it's okay, we, we stole the body. But they didn't. They maintained this fact. So I think it's highly unlikely that the disciples stole the body. Some try to say that the authorities stole the body. They stole it and they kept it for safekeeping so that nobody could claim any kind of resurrection. Well, my problem with this theory is, is why? Because when the resurrection stories began to come out, if there was a body, then the body itself is proof that he wasn't raised from the dead. And as soon as everybody began shouting about a resurrection, all they had to do was say, no, 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 here it is. Here's the body. And the stories would be over and Christianity would be snuffed out on that first Easter Sunday or soon after. You see, the authorities could have done that if they'd had the body. Or they could have just called forward the people who moved the body and, and, and asked them to testify. Um, or they could have taken people to show them where the body now was. They could have done anything. They could have paraded it down the streets if they'd wanted to, so that everybody knew that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. But they didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? Because they didn't have a clue where the body was. They just didn't know. Another popular theory that was very popular with the rationalists in the 18th century was called the swoon theory. And the idea of the swoon theory was this. Jesus was really crucified. And as he hung on the cross, he, he almost went into a coma and he was so, his body was so crushed and beaten that he was just seconds away from death. And thinking that he was dead, he was taken down from the tomb and then wrapped in cloth and then put in the tomb. And then sometime later in the cool of the tomb, now the pressure was off and he was out of the sun. He somehow came to and revived and then came out. So it was the same Jesus who'd been near death, but had really swooned and not actually died. But there's problems, like all these theories, there's problems that just don't fit the facts with, with this theory. Firstly, he really did die. I mean, that's what a crucifix was for. It was, uh, it was a death sentence. It was designed to kill you. The Romans would have tested that every body that was on the cross was died. And if they weren't dead, they would break their legs to make sure that they could not hold themselves up and breathe anymore, um, to make sure that they died. They didn't have to do that to Jesus because he was already dead. He'd have been examined by at least four executioners before the body would have been released to Joseph of Arimathea. He wouldn't have been allowed to take the body had there been any signs of life there. And you'll remember when he was pierced in his side, it says in our accounts that there was a, a flow of blood and water. Uh, there wasn't like an arterial bleed. An arterial bleed would show that there was life there because the blood would be pumping out of his body because his heart would still be pumping it. But this flow of, bl of, of blood and water indicates that there's there's been massive clotting in all of his major, major arteries. For a, a pathologist today, they would say that that flow of serum and, and clots would have been medical proof of death. So Jesus really did die. And also, he was really buried. I mean, this was, you don't bury people that are alive. He was, he was put in this rock tomb on this stone ledge. He'd have been wound tightly in the traditional way in strips of cloth. He'd have had approximately 75 pounds of burial spices and, and a kind of gluey substance to hold it all together put onto him with this tight wrapping and these spices. And he, he'd have been examined prior to that by, by, by the Romans. And the, the, the theory to say that he could somehow then revive and r remove all of all of this without the help of anyone else remember he was bound so he didn't have his hands free he was bound to, to think that he could do that and then without anybody's help somehow roll away a ton and a half to two tons of solid rock it, it just kind of seems a little bit ridiculous 
And then to think that he would kind of stagger, half dead, covered in blood and wounds and strips of cloth and and to stumble out and, and somehow manage to convince everyone that he was fine. I mean, it's, again, seems more ridiculous than the resurrection itself. He clearly had a, a new resurrection body. Without that, he'd have looked awful. People wouldn't have run up to him and said, "You're he's the Lord. People would have looked at him and go, oh, crumbs, how, are you okay? How can we help you? He'd have looked like he'd been on the streets for 100 years. They would have felt sorry for him, wanted to nurse him back to health. You see, for all these theories, there is really only one conclusion that takes into account all the facts and doesn't try to manipulate them to fit our preconceived ideas. The conclusion has to be that Christ did in fact rise bodily from the dead and it was a supernatural act. And that has implications. That means that Jesus, the Son of God, is now alive. And that agrees with everything that the Bible says about him. And it aligns with the experience of thousands, millions of Christians over the last 2,000 years. Now, it goes without saying that you and I have to come to our own conclusion as to how we deal with these facts. But the evidence is clear. This one death, followed by this one resurrection, was a pattern for a new humanity. You see, where man's rebellion had deserved death for each of us, God loved us so deeply that he was prepared to send Jesus through the trial of death and separation so that you and I wouldn't have to. That's how much he loves you and I. So what do we do with these facts? Well, the Apostle Paul, he put it like this in Romans 10 verse 9. He said this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you're prepared to say, yeah, Jesus is sovereign, he's Lord. And I believe that having heard the facts, I believe that it's possible that he rose from the dead. Paul says you'll be rescued, you'll be saved. It means you'll become a Christian. It means you enter into this promise of eternal life and heaven forever. The Apostle John, another apostle, another close follower of Jesus, really close friend of Jesus, he said this in 1 John 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So by believing in him, even today, you become part of his family. You get adopted in as a son or a daughter into the family of God. God becomes like a father to you. You know, before I was a Christian, I really needed a father. And when God became my father, he's proved himself to be the most perfect father. Maybe that's what you need to hear today. And then Jesus himself said this. If you don't believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Now this is important. If we don't believe in him, we will die and we'll be separated from him. And instead of a resurrection to eternal life, we will be separated from him and experience an eternal death. But Jesus died to rescue each one of us from that and to give us the promise of everlasting life. So folks, this Easter Sunday, I'm going to call this decision day, decision time. I've presented to you the facts in one minute. I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to pray with me if you want to believe that this resurrection really happened and if you want to receive eternal life. I don't want you to be nervous or anxious about praying that in the quietness of your own heart, wherever you are, because Jesus hears it 
and he will come to your rescue. See, I did it back in 1992. I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive me. I believed in him and my whole world lit up in beautiful technicolor. Maybe that's gonna be true for you. Maybe Easter Sunday, 2020, in all our homes across this region, Jesus will come and bring you life. Pray with me. Jesus, I have examined the facts and I believe that on that first Easter Sunday you rose from the dead. I believe that you died for me so that I could know you, be forgiven and receive eternal life. Today I choose to turn my back on my old life and I repent of my sin. And I trust you, Jesus, to come in and be my Lord and to give me eternal life. I choose today to receive my new life. Come and fill me with your Holy Spirit and be with me today and forever. For I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. It's been a joy to be able to speak to you. Um, and I hope we'll be able to be together again soon. But in the meantime, I pray that God will bless you and your household and that God First Church will continue to thrive even in the scattering. God bless you. See you soon. Chris, thank you so, so much for explaining the Christian faith to us so well uh, and talking to us about what it means to come into the family of God, to be sons and daughters, to have a father, uh, to have our sins washed away uh, and to know this Jesus who is alive so deeply cares about us. Really just remains for me to say, if, if you have made a decision today to follow Jesus, and really all that simply means at this stage is thinking, I, I believe what Chris has said and I believe who Jesus is and I want to walk forward on this journey. Just click that request prayer button uh, and respond uh, and we will help you on your journey. There's no, going to be no pressure there. We just want to serve you and help you. I think for the rest of us as we listen to Chris, I think the stirring of the truth that we hear is, is just wonderful uh, and just so exciting. That phrase he uses uh, when he said, my whole life lit up like Technicolor, that would be true for me as well and many others uh, who would call God first their home and call Jesus their Lord and Saviour. So thank you so much for joining online. Uh, just to underline those ways of connecting with us uh, through the contact card on the website or on this online platform once this this service ends you can click request prayer and that will come through as an email and someone will be in contact uh, so don't walk away uh, and forget what you've heard if, if God is prompting you to respond to the message you've heard today do respond just so important this is of eternal significance and maybe one of the good things that will come from this incredible crisis and this pandemic we find ourselves in is that you are in a lounge listening to Chris Kilby uh, and learning the truth about who Jesus is. So God bless you, all of you. God bless you, the youngest to the oldest. God bless you, whatever nation you're in. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. And God bless you into this week. See you soon. sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you Release from my chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He can 
cancel my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested and my life began Oh, oh your grace so free Washes over Darkness rejoices though heaven 